writing your annotated bibliography, it's entirely likely that your idea will change. You may pivot, you may shift, things will happen as you start reading. Because right now you probably, I mean, I don't mean to say this to be insulting, but you may not know that much about the subject you want to write about. You've got an idea, you're interested, and that's great. That's where you need to start. But maybe as far as like actual nuts and bolts knowledge, maybe you don't quite have a lot yet. That's fine. You start doing the research, you start writing, and you may have to change your idea a little bit. You may have to pivot. That is perfectly, perfectly valid to do that sort of thing. And you don't have to write up another topic proposal for me. Maybe send me an email and remind me that you're changing your subject. Um, but there's no need to rewrite a topic proposal. This is actually a good thing. Taking a course correction because you run into a brick wall with your research or you find something that's even more interesting than what you, than what you originally started with is wonderful. Wonderful. And I encourage you to follow those kind of like weird research angles. My boss, again, I'm going to talk about him a lot today, Don. He's, he's a good guy. When we were talking about capstones the other day, um, he was talking about how he sees so many students who get laser focused in on one particular angle for their capstone. And they just try to make it work no matter if it's working or not. And when a course correction or a minor little pivot or a little bit more of a change in the process would make their, um, their capstone far more successful uh, and far easier for them to write. So I think it's fantastic that, you know, people are coming on board with like this idea of flexibility and I'm, you know, you know, kind of encouraging it here. So if you run into a brick wall, just move. Don't keep running into a brick wall. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So, you know, there's already enough of a mental health crisis in this world. I'll be damned if my class is going to contribute to it. All right. Any questions on that? I'm going to tidy up our attendance because I see we have a few more people that have come in. Jonathan, Brandon, I think Gloria showed up. Oh, what about Kevin? Kevin Romulus, are you in here? K-Rom. Nope. Okay. So you're still absent. Wait, no, I'm here. Oh, no, that yeah. is Kevin Romulus. Is that you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right on. Did you get it, Frank? Yeah, I got you, Frank. I got you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So let's talk about the final project, the, the final, the all of it. We've started with the topic memo. Now let's talk a little bit more in depth about the other stuff that is to come. Let me get the right screen up for you. Okay. And let me go on to share the scary screen. Um, trigger warning. This is gonna be tough for the next hour. This, remember, topic proposal, presentation, and research paper and annotated bibliography. All of them are coming from the same body of research that you, that you do, and they are also coming, um, and they are also best done in a very specific order. Um, and it's almost backwards to how I always say it. Yes, you propose your topic first. The next thing you want to start doing is your research, right? You should, maybe you're already doing your research because we had the library training last week. So maybe you've already been digging into the databases. Maybe you've been out there looking for, you know, the material that's, that's available to you, starting to think about your idea. You're, you're looking at trade journals, etc. So the next thing you want to start doing is thinking about your annotated bibliography. And the reason I say this is because if you, if you do your annotated bibliography early, you can work on it a little bit slowly. You can work on it a little bit deliberately and you can get it done in four to five weeks. And then your presentation is already written because it comes almost exclusively from your annotated bibliography. And then your paper becomes easier to write because of the, the summarizing of the articles you're going to do, the thought process that goes into writing those and the critical evaluation of the sources that you're going to do. So, for your research, you need to find five sources. Five sources. 
Have we talked about the ideal makeup of those sources in this class yet or not? Have I, I may have alluded to them. Nope. Not yet. Okay. So here's the deal. Um, this is all pretty much here on the list. The list is in, this list is inclusive. The instructions are inclusive, but as with everything, it's, you know, stuff comes out of my mouth to provide context and further instruction. This is the bare bones. Three peer reviewed journal articles. This is my ideal three peer reviewed journal articles. One book, one chapter of a book is fine. One article from a trade publication. That last one kind of hurt. Um, one article from a trade publication. If you cannot find a suitable book or chapter of a book, you can use another journal article. If you cannot find an article in a trade publication, and believe me, I highly suggest you look harder for that because they're like two pages long and super easy to read and valuable for you in, in, in the world of work. But if you cannot find that, you can add another journal article or you can find an interview with somebody in the field that you can cite. That would be the kind of next best thing. But the trade journals are really valuable. Uh, that's why I made sure Janet highlighted them when she did the other presentation last week. The fact that you can filter in the databases by, um, by trade journal. Okay, so you're going to find five of those. You are going to have to write. Professor, yes. Can you repeat that one more time? I sure can. My ideal is three peer reviewed journal articles, one book or chapter therein, one article from a trade publication. If you can't find the article for a trade publication, see if you can find an interview with someone in your field. If you can't find a book or a chapter, you can substitute another journal article. So I, you should consult me for any deviations from those things because that matters. Um, the, one of the learning objectives of this is you learn how to find good quality source material you learn how to evaluate good quality source material and you learn how to work with good quality source material. Professor, yes. when you say journal article, would that kind of be like another peer reviewed? Yeah, journal articles are peer reviewed. Yeah, when I say journal articles, I mean it in the academic sense, i.e. the stuff in the databases that are usually 6,000 to 8,000 words in length each and they are academic and written from a position of research and that's why we're gonna talk about the bibliography, because this is where you start thinking about how you evaluate these things. Okay. So your annotated bibliography for each of those five sources, you need to provide an annotation. Each annotation is roughly 250 to 300 words. Please do not panic yet. There will be time for panic later, but I will mitigate panic on this in a moment three to 500 words per source, which means the annotated bibliography in and of itself will be 1500 words roughly in length. This is why I encourage starting early. This is a lot of work. Simply reading journal articles is time consuming. Um, a standard six to 8,000 word journal article takes me, and I'm, you know, I got a little practice at reading these things now, takes me about an hour and I often need to read them at least twice because they can get really dense, especially if they're outside of my field. Like if they're in my field, I can read them once, mark them up and I'm good. Stuff that gets a little outside or that I'm less familiar with maybe the concepts, I'm gonna have to read it twice. And sometimes I have to read it with a dictionary. You know, no shame in that, learn those words. They're beautiful. So really it's two paragraphs per annotation, one paragraph of summary, one paragraph of evaluation. They're going to be a bit lopsided. The evaluation paragraph is naturally going to be a bit longer. But again, don't worry. I have, I have an out clause. I have a, I have a, I have a thing to save you here. Um, summary, you read the article and just tell me what it says. And to be honest with you, it sounds like a lot to write a summary of something. But if you could spend the next two minutes speaking to me, and telling me about the last movie you watched, 
the last really good album you listened to, if anybody listens to albums anymore, or the last good television show you watched, then you can summarize a journal article in the right amount of words. Average speaking speed is about 100 words a minute. So, you know, if you can spend two minutes telling me about a thing, you've got 200 words you can write. So it's not as difficult or as onerous, if you will, as it may at first sound. So let's talk about the evaluation criteria, because this is where a lot of people start freaking out. So if you're already freaking out, well done, you're ahead of the curve. If you haven't started freaking out, this is where most people do. I want you to evaluate your sources on seven metrics, basically. Um, and we're gonna go through each one, gonna define each one, and then you know, we'll, I'll talk about how to write it, and I'll talk about the fact that I've already written most of it for you. <laughs> so, currency. Um, does anybody know what currency means in regard to academic scholarship? How recent, well done, Vicki. Well done, yeah, is it recent, is it current? Think about currency, you know, dollar, dollar bill, you know, making it rain and all of that sort of things. You want fresh, hot, new information. In the world of business, in all of your business fields that all of you are studying, new information is what you want because you need to action on current data. You know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're thinking about bringing out a new product line, you need research from, you know, the last four or five months, maybe the last year, not five or 10 years ago. You know, you know, if you think about it, you know, just strictly on that regard, the amount of money you would lose if you used research from the 90s about what kind of, you know, toys people want, you'd end up investing in Beanie Babies. And for those of you who don't remember Beanie Babies, a lot of people thought they were going to retire on their Beanie Baby money. They're not. So currency, newness, freshness of information. Authority. Authority is very simple. It's in the title, the author. This is how you assess credibility. Does the person writing the paper have the credibility or the authority to write about this subject? And there are two general ways that we can say that someone has gained authority. Does anybody know what either of those two are? Person that's in that field, maybe. 10 points. Well done, Devin. I think that was Devin. I recognize your voice. I couldn't see you, but you know. Yes, that's me. 10 points. They're not transferable or good for anything, but you have them. Um, so, yes, experience in the field is one way of gaining authority. The other way is by getting degrees, credentials, master's degree, doctorate in their fields. Just about everything has a master's and just about everything has a doctoral level qualification for it. You can get a doctor in nearly anything. Trust me. Um, so those are the two ways we ascribe authority. And for me, I think they're co-equal. I think somebody with, and, and in fact, I would say that somebody with 20 years of experience in industry probably has more authority than somebody who's just come out of their doctoral program who's never worked in that field. So now it doesn't mean that the doctoral person doesn't have authority. I, it's just for me personally, there is something to be said for industry experience. So authority, all about the person. Reliability. This comes down to the journal, to the publisher, the, the vehicle that published the, um, the piece. So if it's a academic journal, you know, or if, you know, you want to look for reliability, the benchmark of quality and reliability is going to be something known as peer review. Peer review. You can filter for that in the library databases. You can also look on the journal's website and they will all tell you whether or not they're peer reviewed. Does anybody know what peer review entails in publishing of this nature? Anybody know anything about that process? Not really. Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 it's 
not impossible, somebody would. Okay, here's what happens. Um, and I've done this, I've been, I'm on the author side, I've been a peer reviewer and I've done editorial work for academic publishing. So I get like a, uh, so I have like a sense of like each and every role that comes here. Um, what happens, yeah, you're close, Joe. You're close, but it's so much more painful than that. What happens is an author has an idea, they write a paper, do their re they do their research, write a paper, send it off to a journal. Pa -pa. Say, Dear journal, you should accept my piece because it's awesome. The editor of the journal reads the piece and makes a decision. Is this good for our journal? Does it fit with the themes of our journal and the type of research we cover? And if it's yes, then the editor will take that piece of writing, that, that article, and send it to two experts in the field. And they will do this anonymously. They, they take your name off of it, send it out to two experts. And the job of those two experts is to go through and destroy that paper. They are looking for every single mistake. They want to look for lack of critical research, lack of synthesis of sources, you know, bad writing. Um, try and think of all the things people have said about me. Just too weird. Um, doesn't make sense. Um, not good. You know, they just, they, they attack everything, every sentence, every word, every paragraph, all six to 8,000 words of it. And once they've done that, that they read it for, for problems and flaws. Then they send it back to the editor, each one independently, sends it back to the editor with a recommendation, um, either reject out of hand, publish with major corrections, or publish with minor corrections. Uh, there's this mythical one, publish with no corrections. I have never seen that in my life. So it's a myth. If somebody tells you they get that, they're wrong. Um, and what that is, is that is a barometer of quality, right? You have two people who are experts in the field who read over somebody's work, not knowing who wrote it, and critique it heavily, strongly, and sometimes hurtfully um, in the process. and make a recommendation as to whether or not it should be printed. And I think that's, you know, that's why reliability is important. You know, when I talk about anybody can post anything on the internet, you know, that's true. But when it comes up in an academic journal, even if the journal is on the internet, that thing's been vetted for quality by at least two, if not three other people. So you can be, you can rest assured that due diligence has been done and what's being presented as good data as sound methodology and as you know, viable conclusions, um, you know, is 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 you know, you're almost too sure. Yes, Jonathan, is there a possibility that the journals can be bunk? Yes, but here's the thing about that. Yes, journals can be bunk, um, and there are bad ones out there. But the academic librarians um, go through, and that's why it's good to use the Palm Beach State library databases because they we buy things from um you know we either have things or subscribe to things that not just that don't just bring in the journals but they actually have um human teams looking at all of the journals and looking at their practices before they allow them to join their families like ebscohost every journal in ebscohost is is vetted again by a team of people to make sure that there is no bunk make sure that there is no um pay for play in those journals um, they, they do happen. I get solicited all the time. I get emails 15 times a week. Hey, we saw your paper and we, we think you should publish something in our journal of know nothing studies. And it's, you know, just, you know, they're, they're out there. But again, that database, the EBSCO host or Sage journals or intellect or business source complete that provides another level of reliability, which is why I, I, I ask students to only use the Palm Beach State College library databases because it's just another means of protecting yourself. Um, this also means when you go out into the private world and you're in the, in the world of work and you're doing research, you're going to have to figure out what databases you need to subscribe to or what libraries you need to stay affiliated with so that you can maintain institutional access. You know, that's, a, that's another critical thing that you'll want to think about. It's why going to graduate school is, is, is a viable option for a lot of people because you just keep access to things. So yeah, that's an excellent point, Vicki. Yeah, not when using the library databases because again, they've, they've, been, they've been vetted and re-vetted and it's a constant process of evaluation. And um, you know, this probably never comes across your radar, 
But for someone like me who's deeply, in, deeply involved in the, in the research culture in America, I know when there are bunk journals because I read about them in the various, you know, like Chronicle of Higher Education. And there's warning calls out there. You know, I know editors and publishers of journals. So I, I have conversations about what's good and what's not good. You know, and the librarians do this even more because it's their job, you know, to make sure that they are only allowing good quality information. So really those top three, currency, authority, reliability, are I think the most important, but they're also the easiest to assess. Um, for this class, currency, let's give it a 10 year window. I may have said that before, but we're gonna stick with the 10 year window. Other classes, they want you to, to have a tighter five year window. Some classes are gonna ask you to have a three year window, i.e. no research older than the last three years. That makes your research process more difficult. I think for a project like this, where I want you to kind of get your feet wet and get used to the process, allowing you to have a deeper pool is the best practice. So 10 years for me. Um, the next one, objectivity versus subjectivity. This is very simple. Objective work, objective research is where the, the researchers really do their best to take themselves out of the equation and they let their data and their research drive their argument and their conclusions. And that's kind of what you want to aim for. You want objective data, even if it doesn't tell you what you want to know, right? Even if it kind of blows a hole in everything you thought you ever believed. Objective data is what you need, especially in the world of business. You want everything to be objective. You don't want somebody in there putting their own special secret sauce all over this work, making the data look different, massaging the data, making it look better than it is or worse than it is. You want somebody who's being objective. Um, it's kind of like numbers, right? Numbers are generally objective. You know, four minus two is always two, at least in this universe. In some other mirror universe or an al alternate universe, it might equal seven. But here, four minus two is always two. That's objective, right? Gold is more valuable than silver. That's objective right now. Um, now, why it is is kind of subjective, but there are legitimate reasons why gold is valuable for technology. But in general, those things are just how they are. It's objective. You don't really know a subjective paper until you read it. It's kind of like you have to read one and go, man, this person is really blowing smoke up my backside about these numbers and about this data. It just seems like there's something not right. Um, if it doesn't pass the smell test, then, you know, realize that subjectivity may be a problem. Nothing is ever going to be 100% objective. But the best papers will have what I refer to as limited subjectivity, limited subjectivity. And these are related to bias, but bias is a bit more insidious. Bias is when people bring their preconceived notions or more than more likely, and this kind of goes to the bunk journal quote question I think that uh, Jonathan had, you know, when somebody is actually paid to write a paper with a specific outcome. This was incredibly um, uh, prevalent uh, during the 70s and 80s, uh, probably before many of you were alive, um, and into the 90s, especially when it came to tobacco smoking and the use of tobacco. We've known since the 60s, 70s, at least, that there was a, a link between cigarette smoking or tobacco smoking and cancer. 90 5% of the journal articles coming out like the, the JAMA and the BMJ and Lancet, all the, the top quality medical research journals were putting out conclusive data that, you know, hey, there's, you know, smoking causes cancer or smoking is linked to cancer and other lung diseases. But there was this weird 5% of data and papers that came out, which were saying things like, yeah, we don't know. Maybe not. This data doesn't look weird. This stuff doesn't look right. We did some research and found that, you know, hey, you can smoke 12 packs a day and just, you'll, you're going to breathe free till the day you die. It's got nothing to do with the tobacco. It's got to do with anything else. 
And what they found out in the 80s and the 90s, especially as a lot of the lawsuits started happening around suing cigarette companies for false advertising and knowingly pushing a, a dangerous and deadly product. Um, and I'll point out, as somebody who was a former three-pack-a-day smoker, they're quite addictive. Um, the, um, what happened was they found out that those papers that were being written that were trying to um, cast doubt on the real data around the link between smoking and cancer, they were all being paid for by Philip Morris, Paul Mall, your various cigarette and tobacco companies, R.J. Reynolds. They were funding all of this research. And the authors were not obligated to say that they were being paid by a cigarette company to write a research paper about the link between cigarette smoking and cancer. And oh, look at this, there isn't one. Cha-ching, walking it to the bank. So what good quality journals are doing now is they're asking for a competing interest or conflict of interest statement where authors have to actually write and sign up and say, I am not being paid by any organization to write this paper or to produce a specific outcome. I wrote a paper about American Gods, a novel by Neil Gaiman's television show too, but I wrote about the book because I'm cooler. Um, and I had to write a statement saying that this was before the television show even came out. I had to write a statement saying that I didn't have competing interests, that Neil Gaiman was not paying me and his publisher, Hachette, was not paying me to write this paper. So it, it, it is taken seriously. That's all you want to look for in bias. I mean, when you read bias, again, you know it's biased. But what I'm asking you to look for are those um, competing interest or conflict of interest statements uh, from the publisher themselves. Academic style and conventions. Does it look like an academic journal article? Does it have an introduction, a body, a conclusion? Does it have thorough in-text citation, a good thorough reference page? Is the language appropriate? You know, just very simple. Does it follow along? Does it look like a journal article? And tone, tone simple. It's either gonna be scholarly, academic, possibly business-like, we can say as a tone, uh, maybe neutral in tone. So, you know, tone is easy, easier. Now, how many of you are finding yourselves a little bit overwhelmed? right now. Yep, that's just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. That's that's perfectly normal and it's natural. Just a little bit, but like just, not only because of you. <laughs> okay, well that's fine. I'm trying not to add more, too much more stress. And in fact, I've written most of this for you and I'm going to even show you what I've done. Here in our lovely course materials folder, I'm going to open that up. That was the Zoom classroom link, huh? Hey, there we go, course materials. All the way down to the bottom of the course materials page is this lovely folder called research materials. Are y'all following me? Okay, once we go into yep, 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 following. Right on. once we hit research materials, here's an example of what one annotation looks like. This was done by a student, she did a fantastic job. You'll note the evaluation paragraph is longer than the summary. That's fine. Got the nice entry here. This is what each one should be formatted as. So they're roughly one page each. But that's not all I have done for you. Oh, no. Because I have, you know, deep and abiding love for all of you, I have created a fill-in-the-blank template for the evaluation. Fill-in-the-blanks. Use this. This is 208 words in length. You may not use all of them because there is some language doubling some of these things. But simply fill it out. This text was published in 2018. Therefore, it has a high degree of currency. There's not too many other ways you can write that. So I've done it for you. You can write them on your own. You can put your own words to paper. You can generate this all on your own if you want. That is perfectly completely 100% fine with me. However, if you'd like to work smarter, utilize the tools I am providing you. <laughs> um, the authors of the text, um, I don't even know what I meant to put in that blank there. Sometimes you want to list them out, but you know, sometimes the author of the text 
does have or does not have X years of experience or advanced degrees or both. This experience or these degrees are relevant to the field of healthcare management. Therefore, they have a high degree of authority. Now, a lot of these are written to indicate that they meet the bar. Have, are we supposed to be seeing something? You can't see this? No, I can't see it. Okay, let me, let me restart my share here. Hold on. I'm so sorry. Here I am going all along thinking you could see me. There it is. Talk to me. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it now. Okay, right on. I can see it now. Sorry about that. It's just sometimes you know, Zoom gets a bit glitchy. Zoom gets a bit glitchy. Now. So again, fill in the blanks. I'm, I'm telling you, very simple. Um, and then just squeeze it in so it looks like a paragraph. Um, I've separated them so that it's easier to see some of them. Um, so again, a lot of these are aimed at looking at um, ones that meet the criteria. It's possible you're gonna read some things where maybe you still want to use them, but maybe the author has undetermined authority. You Google them, there's no author bio in the in the journal. You Google them. You don't find a web page for them. So you cannot tell who this person is. But the article is still kind of good and it's really important and you really want to use it. Sure, you can have what's known as a level of undetermined authority or undetermined currency. Maybe you can't find a date, you know, or undetermined reliability. It's possible you're going to find these things. However, you know, it's a case, it's likely that you might find that maybe through, through your entire five sources that you're using, that you might have like one instance where something is undetermined. So if I start seeing undetermined authority, undetermined currency, undetermined, undetermined authority and reliability, undetermined this, undetermined that, can't tell, don't know, then I'm going to get a bit suspicious. And then your work has to, has to survive the five minute Google test which is where I slap the information from the article and the author into Google, and I spend five minutes timed trying to see if I can find the information. You know, if you do that, like if it happens once or twice through, your, through, your sort, through all of your sources, I'm not gonna bother to do this. I'm gonna take it for granted you're doing your due diligence. But if it happens a lot, um, then, you know, yeah, I'm gonna start looking for things. And then I'm gonna be angry, because that's like time. You know, so, you know, just know that that's a thing. Also, you can work with me and you can work with the librarians and say, look, I can't find anything about this publisher and its peer review system. So, you know, ask ahead, we'll, f we'll figure it out. But again, there's always an out clause. And maybe you find an article that's great on all the metrics and you want to use it, but it's biased or it's kind of subjective or whatever. Um, again, just note that, you know, if it meets, you know, six out of seven or five out of seven, but not the other two, well, you know, don't go looking for a whole nother article. Just put down that it lacks currency. It, the author lacks authority. That's fine. Being able to evaluate things doesn't mean that you're only ever going to find perfect things. It means you're able to discern between the good and the bad. And I'm giving, I've given you the criteria for, you know, good and bad. And again, the, you know, the, those are just, uh, you know, kind of binary choices. Good and less good would probably be better. You know, and just, you know, write it out, be honest about it. This is about honesty in your research process. And it takes a little more stress off, not just because I've written this section for you, but because now you're like, okay, things don't have to be perfect. You know, I just have to acknowledge their imperfections. And again, I think uh, the, the, when I was in Catholic school and I would do things wrong or I wouldn't do my homework because I was bad at math and the nuns were beating me, they used to say all the time, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And they would be spanking me, you know. So, you know, I'm not going to corporal punish anyone, but don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So, yeah, and that's true. You have this forever. And this is the sort of material that in your other classes, you may be asked to write, are any of you being asked to write annotated bibliographies or source evaluations for other classes? If you're not, you probably will be. Um, 
Certainly it will happen on your capstone. Dun, dun, dun. And it will most likely happen in things like strategic management um, or, you know, as you hit those other 4,000 level classes. Um, so do your, you know, so again, hang on to this. This goes by many names. I use an annotated bibliography presentation, um, but other professors use um, literature reviews or, you know, source evaluation. It's all pretty much the same thing. They may have fewer criteria, to be fair, um, but this is kind of a, a survey class where you need to kind of get a, a grip on all of these tools. So I'm, I'm asking you to do all of them, but then again, I'm providing you with a completely written version of it that you could just use. So, um, questions so far? Yes. Go right ahead. I just want to confirm that I'm understanding this properly. So five sources. Yep. And would that each one of those would be considered an annotation, correct? Yeah, you'll annotate each of the sources, yes. So there'll be an annotated bibliography for each source, and each annotation will be three to 500 words? Uh, uh, yeah, let's try to stick with closer to 300, but yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't, I don't know where I got that then. Uh, I probably wrote it that way because I'm, you know, sadistic some days. But yeah, realistically, and I do want to point out for those of you who cannot see the very bottom of my screen down here, this template is 208 words in length. So if you're thinking your annotation needs to be 300 words, we're pretty close already. <laughs> okay. So you really just got to crank out a, a good chunky summary paragraph and then fill and, in the blanks. And of each annotation, um, you were in the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that one paragraph was a summary, one yep. paragraph was an evaluation. Yep. Was there another paragraph in there or is it basically oh God, a no. two paragraph model? Heavens no. We're sticking with two paragraphs, just the two. Understood. Yeah, yeah just, yeah, summary and evaluation. Summary and evaluation. Okay. Thank you. So, oh, hey, no problem. It's a good question. Good question. All right. So I know there was terror about 15 minutes ago. Are we feeling less terror about writing the evaluation now? Yes. Good. Good, good, yeah. good. Good. Excellent. Slightly less. That's fine. Slightly less is better than more. You know, as long as this doesn't make it worse. Um, if this makes it worse, just forget it and do it the way you want to. But just make sure you hit all the benchmarks and do it the way I want. Um, okay. So that's the annotated bibliography. The reason I suggest writing the annotated bibliography first is this. Once it's done, it's done. <laughs> Your journal articles, 6,000, 8,000 word journal articles, are time consuming to read. Um, but they take me about an hour to read each one. So know that you're gonna have to budget in some time for that. Number two, your presentation, there is a portion of your presentation where you give a little mini annotated bibliography because you talk about two of your sources, a brief summary and a brief evaluation. It's on the instructions for the presentation. So again, doing your annotated bibliography is also doing additional work because it's helping you write, you know, two fifths, you know, or, you know, three fifths of your presentation because you'll already have that information to hand. If you work on the annotated bibliography first, then you get ready for the presentation. Say, hey, I've already got some of this. I'm, I've already started. This is wonderful. You know, and then the other parts of it are really just you talking about you. So, you know, and, for paper writing, once your paper is, once your annotated bibliography is written, your paper practically writes itself. You have a good idea, you have done your research, then you go out and you write, you're writing about your research. Oh, uh, this article says this, 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 and this. Maybe in your mind when you're writing your summary, you're not obligated to do this, but it's kind of a nice thing to do. You're writing that summary, but you're also thinking about how that article fits in your paper. And maybe you write that as part of your summary. That's fine. That is totally fine by me. Oh, also, you're only going to use three of these papers or sources in your actual research paper. So you find five, you annotate five. From that five, pick the three most appropriate and use them in your paper. That's another, again, that's another thing that happens in research all the time. You, you will always 
as you're doing it more, and especially when you start doing it for money, um, like in the world of work, you're going to read more than you need, but that's fine. You're getting smarter with every word you read. So how it works. Um, if you need to use a fourth, if you need to use a fourth or a th you know, I hope that you shouldn't need your fifth because the paper is very short, but if you need to use a fourth source, just let me know in advance and we'll talk about it. Um, so I tend to want to hear more from you than from other people, but I have templates and scaffolds and examples of how to make writing the research paper easy as well. In fact, it's probably easier than the evaluation template. So that's to be coming probably next week. It's up on Blackboard, but it helps if I explain it. Um, so yeah, as you're writing those summaries and you're doing those evaluations, you're starting to see how things fit together, how what other authors, what other researchers have said about your subject fits with what you want to say, with what you need to say about your material, what your research is. And your brain's just constantly juicing, spitting out neural transmitters left and right, synapses firing off, and the paper begins to write itself. And you're going to find yourself kind of writing notes, writing outlines, or what I usually do is I write an outline and I copy, like if I want to quote this sentence from, a, um, from Article X, I copy it and I slap it in my outline within the paragraph that I want to put it in and then I move on. That way I have that stuff already quick to hand and I just have to write around it. But, you know, we'll talk about that later because um, I don't want, don't want to scare anybody about the writing process yet. And you'll find, you know, reaching the word limit for the, um, for the research paper will be quite easy. Now, finding this sort of material, right? How do you find an author's authority? I mentioned you go to their website. I mentioned that you might go um, uh, looking around um, online and try to just Google them and see what it is. But there are some other ways uh, to do this. And I'm going to show you um, a couple of them right now. Google is your friend when it comes to this stuff. It really, really, really is. Um, let me bring up Wow, if I could spell, I would be dangerous. Ah, there we go. Back in for screen share. Google Chrome, hopefully nothing nefarious is on any of my tabs, but I have typed in at home in the world tree. It's the article I wrote on Neil Gaiman. It's just the quickest thing that came to mind. So I'm going to click it. This is the journal that it, that it was published in. It's an online journal, but it is peer-reviewed. Um, uh, it's the Open Library of Humanities. You don't need to care about that. Abstract. Very important to read the abstracts. Tells you everything the paper's about. It's been, this has been viewed 2,500 times. It's amazing to me that anybody cares. It's been tweeted 133 times and downloaded 368 times. Some people have, like, no life. Um, they're reading my work. They need, to, they need to choose life. All right. When you scroll down to the bottom of this page, if I'm not mistaken, here is the competing interest claim. The author declares they have no competing interest. This is that bias detection. Also, most of these things, there's going to be an about the author. And I forget where Martin puts them in this journal. I right, probably click it here. No, there is no author information. It's terrible. Uh, no discussions either. So this one, you're going to have to dig for who I am. If we go to the library, we can find some different things. Oh, does anybody remember in the Palm Beach State College Library training last week where Janet mentioned that you can filter for peer-reviewed literature? There's a tick box in all the databases where you say, only show me peer-reviewed literature. I tick that. that. Tick that. And if you tell me you did that, I'm inclined to believe you when you are source evaluating. Okay. Library webpage. Um, uh, journals A to Z. I really have started doing things that I never wanted to do when I taught this class, which is bringing up my own research, but I think it's gauche. 
Okay, the European Journal of American Culture. Take me to your full text access. Oh, Got to click so many buttons to get here. Can't remember if it was 35-2 or 36-2. Must have been 36-2. Ah, ha, ha. Another one of my fine works. Um, again, you'll get an abstract, my email, author affiliation. So this doesn't tell you too much, but name of the article. It's I have too many tabs open. Okay, ah, but here's the paper itself and all of its living gloriousness. Um, I don't believe my is my author bio at the bottom of this one. Aha, uh -huh. author bio. It's usually included with the article. Sometimes you have to um, dig a little bit deeper and go to the front matter, go to the table of contents. We'll have like notes on contributors, that sort of thing. Um, so again, you're gonna find all the stuff you need on authority for most good peer reviewed academic journals right here. I'm gonna come back here to the European Journal of American Culture and I'm gonna go to the journal's website. We're gonna do some practice on this next week, don't, or next class, don't worry. So, okay. So, if you're thinking about reliability, try to find the website for the journal. You may not, you don't have to go through all this back end in the library. This stuff is usually available just on Google. In fact, I know this one is. And look at this, the homepage of the journal, the European Journal of American Culture, is a peer-reviewed journal. Oh, simple. Find the journal title, Google it. If it doesn't say it right there, it's usually under like call for papers or author submission, that sort of thing. Um, so it probably does, you know, original work, yada, 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 free PDF. So yeah, this one puts it right up front, but if not, it's gonna be under like notes for authors or notes for contributors or anything like that. So, easy to find utilizing Google. Currency, authority, reliability. You do have to read them for objectivity, you do have to read them for bias, and you actually have to read the paper for tone. I haven't figured out a life hack around those things yet, although with tone, if, you, if it's a scholarly journal, just put scholarly. Okay. Questions, concerns, hopes, fears, and or nightmares that you may be experiencing. You're gonna be available every step of the way, right? Of course, of course. Yeah, well, that's all we want to hear. <laughs> no, Same. Of <laughs> I, I, I don't know how, I, I know I can remember being a student. I can remember especially my transition from year two to year three at university. And I went from Palm Beach State College. I, was, I, I did my first two years. Well, I did my first two years at like when I was in the Navy, I did some of it. When I was in Virginia, I did some of it. Then I came down here and got serious. So my first two years at, at, at Palm Beach State. And then I went to FAU for the last two years to complete my bachelor's degree. And I felt completely unprepared for year three because it is a quantum leap in some of these things. And unfortunately, there are people who automatically think that you are, that you know things already because they expect you to know them because 50 years ago when they were in school, they taught them to first year students. And now we have to teach people vastly different things in the first year of university. Um, but I, I have not forgotten the fact that I went and sat in my very first English class as an upper division student and had no clue how to do research. I didn't know how to, um, you know, anything. 
It was completely bonkers. And I had to learn and it was tough. And then it got weirder when I went to graduate school because they thought that we knew how to do grad school stuff, like our first day of grad school. And it's like, there's this weird concept, I think, in higher education where people think that you already know how to do the things that they're supposed to be teaching you how to do. And I guess my only point on that is I understand that you don't know how to do these things and I don't expect you how to do these things. I am here to help you do these things and I'm here to provide tools to help you do these things in an easier, less, not stress-free, but a somewhat less stressful fashion. So yes, I am here to help you. That is, that's what I do. Oh my gosh, you have three classes like that? And you have two classes like that? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's it. Teach me, maybe show me an example. Give me a scaffold that I can fill in and then moving on. Moving on. Yeah. I just, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why that is. That is, but I've known people at every level of higher education um, that teach students who are, and they're usually, when I was in England, that was really terrible. I taught second language students and there was a guy I worked with who was an awful human being and just used to get angry that students coming directly over from China who did not speak very much English actually didn't speak very much English. Like the fact that he had a job, like he was angry that he had to teach people how to, how to read, write, and speak in English. Dude, that's what you get paid for. So, but no, I, I, I get it, at least as much as I can. I mean, I know I don't get it fully, but you know, I, I do get it. Um, all right. Are there any other questions? Somebody dreams about an ocean. I, I saw that. If you have a dream about going to a class at four o'clock, that's more like a nightmare for y'all. For me, it's fine. But for you, this could, I imagine this is a nightmare. Questions. All right, let's do, I'm going to do a quick round robin with anybody. Melinda, questions? Thumbs up, thumbs down. I can see you. You're good. Me, I don't have any questions. Jason, anything? I'm good. Right on. Lindsay? Robert? Um, with regards to the topic proposal, can you share that uh, memo page, that uh, demo that you showed? The, earlier um, the, in class? The, the scaffold or the, um, the, 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 like the, the design memo format? Um, yeah. I think I closed it. Let me see here. Is it still available? Because I think I, ha I found one that was similar. I just wanted to make sure if it was like the same. You know one. what I'll do? Let me save it to my desktop real quick and I'll pop it into the chat window. How does that sound to everyone? That sounds awesome. File, save as memo. Let's go desktop so I can find it. Ah, I should have thought to do that before class. So, you know, here we go. It's and like the one I found is like a bunch of like logos and designs on the bottom. And it just seems like to be taking a lot of space. So. Yeah, it can be, yeah, it can be kind of, they're, they're just, they're busy. It's busy. Okay, there we go. Memo coming in to the chat window for everybody to use. Awesome. Gloria, questions, concerns, hopes, fears, anything going on there? No, you said you're good, I think. Yeah. You're good, okay. Joey Fitz, you got anything? All good, sir. Right on. Gigi? I'm fine, Professor. Right Thank on. Thank you. Odali? I'm living. You're living? Right on. That's good, Vicky. <laughs> Vicky, Vicky. Vicky, you've asked some questions, so you're, you're good. Famita, do you have anything? Famida. We're good. Right on. Nicholas, I know you've asked a couple questions. Anything else? Uh, not about like what you just recently talked about. I was waiting till the end of class to bring it up. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, it was, it was a couple for like, cause it was a couple for like the resume that we did yesterday. Right. Yeah. Also, I had, I got the, my resume done, but I'm like just finishing my cover letter and I was okay. going to talk to you about that. Yeah. But I was waiting until like everything got done. That's fine. That's fine. Um, what's going on? So yeah, I was just going to like, like talk to you about that and okay. say that I'm about turned in. Um, it hasn't been turned in. That's perfectly fine. No, not yet. I, I haven't even looked yet. So we're good. Right. Devin, uh, you said you were all good, I think. Yes, I'm good. Jose? Yeah, I'm all good. Right on, Keandria? Except for your other class, is everything going fine? Yes, I'm good. Right on. Aaliyah? Is it Aaliyah or Alia? I cannot remember. I'm so sorry. It's Aaliyah. Aaliyah. Okay. I'm good. Right on. Alexander? I'm good. 
Kevin? Still with me, Kevin? Yep. I'm good. Frank? Hanging in there, Frank? Everything okay? Wilfred? Wilfredi, excuse me? Yeah, I'm fine. Right yeah. on. Monica? I'm good. Brandon? Oh, good. John, you've already said you're good. What about Marie Carmen? I'm good. Right on. Frank, did you did you make it back yet? Frank maybe AFK. Okay then. I have nothing else yes, sir. for you. Right on. Oh, there he is. There he is. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A full accounting. I love it. All right. So if y'all don't have any questions, I, that's enough for the day for you, I think. Uh, I will release you into the wilds of the internet. It's a couple minutes early, so you're welcome. Uh, Thank you. And I will <laughs> see you. you all on Thursday. Thank you. I just had one more question with regards oh, sure. to uh, the, the memo. When it says to, like the recipient name, is that sending it to you or is that to someone with regards to my degree? Send it like to my me. company. Send it's it to you? To okay. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. And how happy were you Sunday night with that football game? I didn't watch it. Uh, it was a good game. Which one? So yeah, I oh, watched the Dolphins. My, my team, my Patriots. Yeah, the Patriots. I, I mean, <laughs> looking into Cam, Cam Newton, I mean, how, how the hell does Bill Belichick do that? I mean, you know, you, lose, you get rid of Brady, who's falling apart, <laughs> and you bring in Cam Newton, who's equally, you know, who could be equally as good. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Terrible. Well, I guess we have uh, at least a preliminary answer on coach or quarterback. Yeah, no, I think for sure. I think it was more when they left. I think it was more of a yin yang where you can't have one without the other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think Belichick will be more successful in the short term. I, I think Brady's mm -hmm. one, and I think he's got one year left. Maybe, maybe oh, one and a half. For sure, for sure. And I'm grateful for what grateful for what he was able to do. It's just hey, he oh, oh, your I mean, age, I'm you know, gets to you. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's all good, man. But no, uh, last <laughs> Sunday game. night though, it was a really good game. You, yeah, anyways, you have a good evening. You, you have a good well. evening, sir. You as well. Hello, Professor. Yes, hey. Hey, I was able to make it in. I see you. I heard you. Fantastic. Very good. Good, good. Any questions? Um, yeah, I'll just keep up to date with the assignments and, and get going. But I just wanted to make sure I was logged in. Oh, yeah, you are. Okay, I noted good. you. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, um, thank you. Sir, Bye. Yes. So I had a pretty rough weekend, and I completely forgot to submit the thing, like my okay. cover letter and my resume. Okay. Can I turn it in? Yeah, still? yeah, it's still open. Go ahead. Okay, Go perfect. Ahead. Thank you. Don't sweat it. All right. Any other questions, Nicholas? Oh, sorry. No, I was. I was okay. Apologies. Oh no worries. Have a good no day, worries. Professor. You as well. You as well.